Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Fuse Accessories, Muddy Outdoors, Cabela's, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Frigid Forage, Rocket Broadheads, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Ozonics, Wilderness Athlete, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. Today I'm going to take you on a little walk. We're going to start right here at the shop and uh, cover some of the timber right close to the house here. I'm going to talk about postseason scouting and I'm going to get a site uh, started for the uh, Trophy Rock Mineral site or Mineral Lick. So let's get rolling here. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, postseason scouting is a super important part of what we do. So there's a lot to learn and every year I try to pick up a little bit more information on the deer that I'm hunting. I'm going to talk about my site selection here for my trophy rock. I try to use the same spots every year because the deer get used to finding the mineral in those locations. It takes a little bit of time some years to get a site accepted and being heavily used. So once you've got that going, it's best just to keep using that same spot. And when you're picking a location, you want to have a few things in mind. We're right off the edge of a food plot here. And this is a high traffic area. There's some trails that come through here, heading up into that food plot. But it's also a spot that I don't hunt. And it's really important in, in many states now to get that part figured out. Uh, some states don't allow mineral use, and the ones that do, there's usually some restriction. So check with your game warden to find out for sure. In Iowa, the whole thing is sort of up in the air as, as far as how the mineral is gonna be treated this coming, this coming year. Right now the legislation hasn't been sorted out, so it's legal, uh, but you know, I've always talked with my game warden about you know, what constitutes baiting in Iowa. And you really need to talk to your own uh, game warden for your area to make sure that you know, his understanding and your understanding are exactly the same so you don't run into trouble later. You don't want to assume anything. So I'm going to put my rock here. This is a spot I've used in the past. And once the deer start to grow antlers a little bit, I'm going to get a trail camera on that tree right there. So it'll be one of these kind of spots where even though I'm not going to hunt right here, uh, it's going to give me some feedback of what type of deer are using this little food plot up here. And uh, you know, possibly I could hunt them someplace else where the wind is a little bit more favorable and the chances of, of being able to hunt undetected are better. So let's talk for just a second about what's in these things. and. Uh, there have been a lot of biologists that have studied what deer need. So I haven't done that. I just trust that they know what they're talking about. But there's a lot of trace minerals in the trophy rock. And it's not just a, a salt block. It's actually a mineral site or a mineral lick. And it's got calcium, phosphorus, uh, salt, magnesium, potassium, sulfur, manganese, zinc, iron, copper, and iodine. And the cool thing about this is it's mined right out of the ground. It's not fabricated, so it's 100% natural. And uh, I don't know if deer care whether it's natural or not, but it is kind of nice to know that we didn't have to manufacture this stuff out of you know several different types of minerals. It's all in one chunk coming right straight out of the ground. All right, next I want to talk about postseason scouting. And uh, this is something that's really important because every year we can learn a little bit more about the deer that we hunt. And you never know too much. Uh, in fact, you know, it's easy to say you never know enough because if, if you knew enough, you'd never have seasons like some of the ones I've had where I don't kill anything. So what you learn during this time of the year is really important. And you've got a certain window left now, depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, but as soon as it starts to really green up, uh, you lose your visibility and you can't see the lay of the land nearly as well as you can now. So you want to get out and do your postseason scouting now. So there's a couple things that we look for when we're scouting. Um, like I said, the terrain is really important, but also the sign. Uh, so those, you know, we'll talk, I'll talk today about how those two kind of work together and, uh, you know, how you, 
how you really um, bring that information in and come up with a plan for the following season. Putting together a plan when you're scouting is really no different than putting together a plan when you're hunting. You got to figure out what's most important to your success on any given day of hunting and then those are the things you got to make your priority when you're scouting. So I've learned the hard way over the years that you have to hunt backwards so that means that you have to scout backwards too. By that what I mean is you start with your entry and exit routes and you figure out where those are at, you find those and then you determine whether or not there's some good areas near those good you know undetectable entry and exit routes uh, where you can you know get a good stand location and and uh, cover some sign or cover some terrain features that would make you think that a deer is going to come past. So as I stand here uh, and, and I've hunted this area some so I mean it's not like I'm coming in here cold so I've got a little bit of a head start on you here but there's two ditches there's one on either side of this little bottom field and there's a main creek that runs at the very bottom of this valley and I've used that creek a lot you come in the creek and then come up these ditches when you're hunting these timbers that are on the edge of this open field and I've had good success in fact uh, back in 2005 I was hunting uh, Nick Munt was here filming before he he was one of the bone collectors he was filming for Realtree at that time and I killed a buck that ended up on the Realtree Outdoors show and the Monster Bucks videos a lot of people remember it because our kids were really young then and they were helping me to blood trail the deer and it was you know pretty comical their reactions and the fights that they got into over you know who who counted the right number of points and but anyway we came in the creek and up the ditch to the tree stand and we hunted there a couple of times and the reason that we were able to con consistently hunt that spot is because we could get out of there literally without a single deer knowing the stand itself was in a tree that was right on the edge of the ditch so we would climb down at the end of the evening out of that tree and get right into the ditch, follow the ditch down to the creek, follow the creek up to the bridge, and then just walk up the road back to the vehicle. And uh, we, I mean, we could walk right past deer. So that was an important uh, aspect of being successful on that hunt. So I'm gonna take you over and show you that. And I'll show you even the tree that we killed that deer out of, and then explain sort of how that thing all unfolded. We're at the spot now where the deer used to cross this ditch and they still do a little bit there's a jump here but back when i hunted this all the time there was a tube in this ditch and we used to be able to drive a tractor back and forth between these two fields on that tube and if the tubes aren't big enough and you get a big rain what happens is the water comes over the top and back washes and it washes basically that you know the the dirt out from underneath the tube and that happened over the course of a few years and i never got that thing you know set back in there decent eventually the whole tube just blew right out and I just took it out of here and you know, used it someplace else on the farm. So I went from a spot here that was above the tube where the deer, the deer would come around the deep part of the ditch to the top part of the tube or above the tube and then cross and the ditch was only about maybe a couple feet deep. But now after that tube blew out that all washed out now too. So we've got this massive ditch and it's great for access but I'm not so sure how much funneling we've got of the deer right here anymore. The stand that we were hunting was that big cottonwood right there. It's only less than 10 yards from the ditch. And we could climb down the back side of the tree. That was all food on the other side. That field is now in uh, switchgrass um, and, and maple trees. That was all food. So the deer would be out there feeding in the evenings. We could climb down the back of that tree, even two of us, and carefully sneak over here and drop into this ditch. And we would follow this ditch all the way down to the creek. Like I said, follow the creek uh, over to the bridge and then uh, walk up on the road. So I'll tell you exactly how this spot worked. And you might get a kick out of it because we're only, oh gosh, when Mike Sawyer would come over and hit golf balls off my backyard, he could hit a driver to here. So he's a pretty long hitter. So I'm saying we're 300 yards uh, from the house. In the evenings, we would walk down from the house and make a little swing out into this other field and come into this spot from this direction because we figured the deer were bedded up in here and that little piece of timber and a lot of the timbers on that side. So we stayed away from those spots, walked down here from the house. But before we did that, we would run the four-wheeler around and drop it off up on top of the hill on the road and then you know ride back in the, in the truck. So at the end of the legal shooting time, we'd have a, a vehicle that we could use to run back to the house. So it was, 
you know, sometimes the entry route and the exit route aren't the same because you have to avoid where the deer are at the time that you're on your, on your feet. So the deer might be bedded in a certain spot and then they're feeding in a different spot. So on your route in, you have to avoid where they're bedded and on your route out, you have to avoid where they're feeding. And that may mean that you have to have two different routes. So that's what we did here. I thought you'd get a kick out of this spot. It was, I would say this was one of the coolest spots I ever hunted, uh, just from how bulletproof it was and, and how you could hunt this thing so consistently and have the deer so close and they never knew that you were there. So look for spots like this. Uh, I talk about ditches and creeks a lot. And if you don't have ditches and creeks, then you just have to be patient with me because that's one of the key features that I look for every time I go into a new area to hunt. And when I'm doing my scouting, I'm spending most of my time around these types of terrain features. I'm trying to figure out, you know, obviously how can I access through these features, but I'm also looking for the best stand locations that are near them so that you know, as I'm coming and going, I don't have to get very far away from the entry and exit route to get to my tree stand. So that's like I said, like 10 yards over and you know, there's no stand in there anymore. There's no food here and the crossing's halfway gone. So, you know, hunting spots change, but that was a pretty cool one when it worked. There's no way that a deer could possibly see me when I'm down in here. I mean, even if they were, you know, 20 yards away up on that field, either side, my head is completely concealed by this ditch. And if I had to, and I normally wouldn't have to, but maybe as it starts to widen up, you know, where you might be visible from one side or the other, I can just pull right up underneath this bank. I mean, just completely disappear. Uh, you could almost hunt down in here and poke your head around and, and look for deer out in the fields. But uh, this is what I would call like a no brainer type of a setup. Cause you don't have to think very much. When you see a spot like this, it's a definite green light. When the, ac when the access in and out is this good, uh, you know that you're going to be able to get away with hunting that spot consistently without educating any deer. And if you can do that over the course of a season, that's basically the definition of a successful season. Because the number one thing that keeps you from being successful is the deer know that you're hunting them. I'm going to walk down to the creek now and we'll talk about uh, the two things that well, the, the one thing that most people look for is deer sign. And I'll talk about why that's a lower priority for me than studying the terrain. I'm standing down at the creek now. And one of the things, I mean, creeks obviously have a high bank like the one I'm standing on and a low bank on the other side. Every time there's a bend, you get this, this exact effect. Deer don't normally bail off and cross a creek where you've got a high bank like this. They'll find spots where you've got a gradual bank on both sides of the creek and those are gonna be your primary crossings. And if, if, if you start looking at the way creeks lay, you'll see that a lot of them have an S bend. And you've got a, a high bank on this side and then the creek bends the other way and you got a high bank on the other side. Well, in between those two bends, you've got a more of a gradual bank on both sides of the creek. So I always look at the aerial photos, topo maps, uh, before I start scouting. And one of the things I look for are these S bends in the creeks. And this one's got a pretty, a pretty uh, uh, you know, specific one right in this spot. And we'll go down to this corner and you'll see there'll be a deer crossing uh, hitting that part of it. And I'm sure if we went up here, we'd see another deer crossing there. And then once we get through this, I'll talk a little bit more about deer sign, like I said. Now we're down on that bend in the creek, a real high bank here, a real high bank behind me, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is the middle of the S curve. So you've got a gradual bank on that side and a gradual bank on this side. There's a pretty good crossing right here. It's not nearly as well used or pronounced as it would be if there was food. Um, you know, on one side or the other of this. I mean, we've got the bedding cover here, but we just don't have food on this side. So the deer aren't using it as much as they would if there was food here. But you get into the rut and you get bucks moving, getting from point A to point B, they're not nearly as focused on, you know, going from bedding to food. They're just more interested in going from one area where there might be a doe to another area where there might be a doe. And these types of spots really start to pick up more action at those times. This brings me to my final discussion uh, on today's episode. And that's the trade-off between scouting for sign versus scouting for terrain features. And, and 
sometimes they're one and the same. Sometimes you'll get those, those terrain features that the deer are heavily influenced by where you'll find a lot of sign. You'll find trails going through an open gate or going through a creek crossing uh, or you know, going around the end of a ditch. Uh, maybe you'll find uh, you know, a saddle and there's a big heavy trail going through that. That's more what you're gonna find during this time of the year when you're scouting now. Because some of those, uh, some of that sign was made by bucks during the rut. And they're not necessarily uh, gonna be spots that are gonna be really active at other times of the year. Postseason scouting reveals some of that for you because you do see some of the rut sign or a lot of the rut sign uh, that's left over from November. I'm not nearly as interested in the sign as I am in the train features that tend to create the sign. Uh, like I said, you can have a spot like this that doesn't show a real heavy movement through it because there's no food over here. But this is the kind of spot that during the rut, a buck is gonna use to get, like I said, between point A and point B. So you wanna file those things away in your memory. You don't wanna get so focused on the sign that you sort of miss the big picture. And that is what are the things that cause the deer to move? Uh, and, and really, I mean, we're gonna keep it simple in today's episode. There's a lot of things that cause deer to move but they'll take a certain route, especially the bucks during the rut, based on it's the, the, the point of, of least resistance between where they are and where they wanna to get to. So they'll use the saddles, they'll use the creek crossings, they'll use the spots where they go around ditches, they'll use you know, those trails that are a little ways down off the top of a ridge. Uh, they'll use those a lot more uh, during the rut than they might during other times of the year if it's not a part of a feeding pattern. So anyway, that's, that's the tip I'm gonna leave you with on today's episode. We can come back and talk about some more of this. Uh, I think there's a lot to cover with uh, the, the types of factors that make deer move and, and specifically what makes bucks move and why do they travel in, in certain routes that they use. Uh, but just to wrap it up, I'm not concerned about the sign nearly as much as I am about the things that create travel routes and that's the terrain. So get out and do some postseason scouting uh, really study the terrain. Get your aerial photos and topo maps out first and uh, get a real good sense of, of what you think is going to happen and then get out there and verify all your hunches. Well, I appreciate you joining me this week. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big. <music>